Elizabeth Elliot is one of the best known Christians of the 20th century. After the death of her husband, Jim, and four other missionaries in Ecuador, Elizabeth famously returned to live and minister among the same people who had killed her husband just years before. Her legacy, however, extends far beyond those events. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Lucy S.R. Austin, who spent over a decade studying Elizabeth's life, thought, and writings. In this interview, she shares her experience meeting Elizabeth near the end of her life, insights into her missionary work in Ecuador, and how her writing in the years that followed impacted thousands of believers around the world. Lucy S.R. Austin is a writer, editor, and teacher. She served on the editorial staff of the Spring Hill Review, contributed to various publications, and developed two high school English textbooks on prominent Christian authors. Her research into Elizabeth Elliot are published in a new biography for Crossway called Elizabeth Elliot, A Life. Let's get started. Lucy, thank you so much for joining me today on the Crossway Podcast. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So can you just describe uh, very briefly who was Elizabeth Elliot? Uh, Elizabeth Elliot was a foreign missionary in Ecuador in the 50s, and her uh, husband was killed in the process of trying to reach a previously uncontacted people group, um, and she wrote a book about it, and uh, the rest is kind of history. Yeah, yeah. And my understanding is that you had a chance to meet her before she died. I think it was in 2015, is that when she passed away? Yes, in June of 2015. And so when did you get to talk with her and, and meet with her? Um, so I was invited to um, be in her home um, and spend some time with her and Lars Gren, who was her third husband, um, in the fall of 2014, um, which was a, a neat opportunity. Yeah, I can imagine. What was that like? What kind of conversations were you able to have with, with her and her husband? Uh, Well, she was in the late stages by that point of dementia, and so um, she wasn't able to really converse, um, or I wasn't able to really understand her, Mm. but it was neat to spend time with her and to be in their home and and to get to spend some time talking with Lars. That's such an interesting, you know, in many ways sad um, reality, just given how, uh, as you mentioned already, how prolific she was as an author and as a speaker. You know, her voice was heard by many, many people on the radio for years. Yeah. What was that like for her? Do we know anything about as she got older, what that aging process was like as she kind of dealt with that dementia? I'm sure it must have been really challenging and difficult to face. But as as Lars has said, I think she approached it the way she had a been approaching the hard things in her life for years, which was to accept it as something that God had allowed uh, and to walk with the Lord in it. Yeah. What was it that first then got you interested in in her and her life? And it, how did that end up with you getting an invitation to, to visit them at their home? Um, well, so when I was in high school, uh, in my Easter basket, my mom gave me a copy of Passion and Purity. And uh, and I know I was impressed with the sense of, of gravitas that the death of Jesus lends to our lives and our choices, that we're important and we're loved, uh, and that so what we do matters. And uh, so based on reading that book, then I noticed that my mother had no graven image on her shelves, um, which was the only novel that, that Elliot ever published. And so I picked that up and read it. And I had read at that point as a a high school girl a lot of christian fiction (laughs) um and and this book was different it was very different and i don't know that i analyzed it at the time but looking back on it now the story doesn't have the kind of tidy polished ending um that you often see and the uh the female protagonist is not married at the end of the Mm. book uh which is different it had a very different view of the key issues in life are so I don't want to say anything else and spoil the story for people who haven't read it, but but it that was the book, I think, that kind of fixed her in my mind and yeah. ultimately led to me writing about her. Yeah. When was that book published? Um, in the mid-60s. Mid-60s. Did you explain how you actually got invited to their house? I was actually writing another project that I had to do a short biographical sketch of 
Elizabeth Elliot for, and my my I was doing several biographical sketches, and I would get all the biographies that existed from the library, read them and take notes, and then write my biographical sketch. And when I went to do that for Elliot, I discovered that there was no biography of Elizabeth Elliot, and I thought that doesn't seem right. <laughs> Um, But I, so I had to go to source material to write that sketch. She captured my imagination. I was very intrigued by kind of some of the things that initially seemed contradictory in her views and and her personality and also just her accomplishments are impressive. And so I finished that project and put it to bed. And several months later, I woke up in the middle of the night with an outline for a biography of Elizabeth Elliot in my head. And I thought, oh, maybe I'd better, <laughs> maybe I'd better see if I can work on this. You so need, you got to fix that problem. Yeah. So I started doing research and reaching out to contact people about interviews and those kinds of things. And, um, and in that process, uh, was emailing back and forth with Lars and talking to him about a phone interview. And at one point he said, well, I really do better in person. You should just come see us. Mm. Um, Was he reticent or skeptical at all of the idea of someone writing a biography on Elizabeth? You mentioned that he, he kind of viewed himself as protecting her and guarding her, especially uh, in that period of uh, her struggling with dementia. Was that ever an issue? I'm sure. I'm sure it was. Yeah. We had corresponded for a bit by email um, and I had had a chance to kind of explain where I was coming from with the book which Elizabeth Elliot said in the intro to her biography of Amy Carmichael that she was presenting a picture of someone whose answer to the Lord's call had made a difference in her life and I had had the chance to share that that was where I was coming from Um, and I think that that was I hope at least that was a helpful helpful to know. And also, I mean, we had discussed, she did not want biographies written of her while she was still alive, uh, understandably. Mm. I wouldn't either. Mm. And so we had also discussed waiting yeah. until she was with the Lord. So how would you then summarize taking a step back and, and thinking about your whole life and your journey with, with Elliot over the years? How would you summarize the impact that she's had on you personally? I think one thing that I've really been observing is that I think that it's easy to think of people as being static beings, um, particularly once we reach adulthood. We grow up and then that's who we are. And looking at her life, the way we approach it in biography, childhood, teens, early adulthood, major life events, middle age, old age, it's really highlighted how how multifaceted and always changing we all are. And I really appreciated Elliot's emphasis on on leaning into that growth and that change and really actively pursuing God at every stage of her life. I don't think she ever said, I'm too young or I'm too old or I've arrived. And Psalm 84 talks about people with their hearts set on pilgrimage they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. And I see that heart set on pilgrimage in her, and I want that heart set on pilgrimage. And part of that idea of pilgrimage is just that you're not home. Mm-hmm. You're not home yet. This isn't your final destination. Do you think that was a big part of her own thinking about her life and what it meant to be a Christian? Definitely, yeah. Where do you think that came from for her? That's a good question. I think she often felt different in childhood uh, and in early adulthood from the people around her. Um, And then particularly after Jim, her first husband, was killed, I think she felt very isolated by that experience in a lot of ways from from other people who hadn't shared that kind of experience. Yeah. Uh, And I'm sure all of those things contributed. Yeah. Yeah. What was her childhood like? Was she raised in a Christian home with Christian parents? And... She was, yeah. Her um, family were pretty well known in the evangelical world. Her father um, ran the Sunday School Times, which was a big deal back then. <laughs> uh, it would be hard to believe nowadays. But... Yeah. and uh, Was that like a newspaper or a magazine? It was kind of a, a blend, um, and it was 
it was articles and poems and lessons and just a whole bunch of stuff and you could have it in your home and read it or Sunday school teachers could pull from it to design their own curriculum. Yeah. So, but her childhood was, was a pretty normal, would you say? Yeah. She had loving parents and a whole bunch of brothers and a sister and family in the area that they visited and played with friends in the neighborhood and they had a dog and, mm, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then she eventually ended up at Wheaton College. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And what did she study there? Um, she started as an English major and then the summer, I want to say it was the summer between her junior and senior year, she switched to being Greek major. Hmm. Um, because Greek. yeah, at, she was, I believe she was the first woman to graduate from the Greek program at Wheaton. Wow. So and what was behind that decision? She had been praying for over a year about what the Lord wanted her to do after she graduated and had come to the conclusion first that she was to go to the mission field um, and then that she was supposed to major in translation. Uh, and so she cut out a lot of extracurriculars to make room for kind of playing catch up with Greek uh, so that she would have a basis for um, translation. Yeah. You mentioned that she was the first graduate uh, of the Greek program at Wheaton at the time. Was that something that she faced kind of any, were there any pressures against doing that that she faced? Or was that, how was that perceived by, you know, her peers and the teachers? I'm not sure if there was a lot of peer response. There were other women in the program. She just graduated first, but it seems like she was um, welcomed with open arms by the professors because they kind of moved things around to let her stack her classes and get through them faster. Yeah. And so was her plan from at that point to go to the mission field or was it to stay you know, on the home front and do Bible translation from the United States? At that point, her plan was already to go to the mission field. Mm. Wow. And, and what was that? Just paint a picture of what that would have been like at the time, the idea of a, a single woman going out by herself, or was the plan to go with a team or an agency? What, kind of what was the what was the goal there? She, at this point in her life, she had moved out of the denominational umbrella that she had grown up in and was part of the Plymouth Brethren, um, which was the same, not a denomination, mm. uh, that uh, Jim Elliott had grown up in. Yeah. And um, and they had their own kind of process, which was that you had to be known by an assembly, and an assembly had to approve you going to the field. Uh, and they preferred, or I think perhaps required, that you go in a team of at least two. Um, and so she, through connections with the Brethren, there was another single woman who was who felt called to Ecuador, and so they would have they went as a team. Mm. And so, when then she she took off for Ecuador, did she know Jim, who would go on to be her husband at the time, or did that happen afterwards? They had met Jim and Elizabeth's younger brother Dave were real good friends at Wheaton, and he had been to their home for Christmas, and uh, so they knew each other um, and had been in a kind of on again, off again, uh, relationship for some time before, before he sailed for Ecuador in, I want to say like January and then she sailed in April. Okay. So. Of 1955, is that right? 52. 52. Okay. So then when did they get married? It would, it was October 8th cause it was his birthday and it was, it would have been, it must've been 54. Okay. Yeah. And then famously, I'm sure many of our listeners uh, know the story. It's, it's become, it seems to me at least, a little bit like evangelical myth, um, the story of, the tragic story of uh, Jim's death and the death of, I think, four other missionaries. Yes. Can you just walk us through kind of what happened, how that happened, and kind of the impact that that then had on Elizabeth and the others who were there? Um, I can try. It's a big story. So they were, after Jim and Elizabeth were married, they were living on a station in the jungles of eastern Ecuador called Shandia and working among the the Quechua people who were there. And there were other missionaries on stations close by. So Pete and Olive Fleming were in Puyapungo, which was a little ways away. And Nate and Marge Saint were 
nearby, and Ed and Mary Lou McCulley were nearby, and then a friend of Nate's, Roger Udarian, and his family were a little farther away yet. Mm. But were these all accessible via car? Could they like take a quite quick oh, drive? Oh no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, there was so Nate was kind of the the connecting point because it was his plane that was pretty much it was plane or foot were the ways wow. to get there. Wow. Um, and it was hours of hiking generally if you didn't have the plane. So. Is this like thick jungle? Is that what should, we should be picturing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What I mean, that is just... Um, and steep hills and hmm. lots of mud. Yeah, lots of mud, <laughs> bugs and animals and... Yeah, poisonous snakes. So yeah, yeah, keep going. What, what then kind of happened? So they had known about this tribe, this uncontacted tribe, since before leaving uh, the U.S., and it was kind of, a, I think, a dream of Jim's to do pioneer work and reach a completely uncontacted tribe and some of the other missionaries as well. And so um, they kind of all had it in the back of their minds. Wouldn't it be cool mm, yeah. if we could do this? And then one day on a flight to do something else, Nate accidentally happened to spot their houses in the jungle of this tribe. Wow. So they kind of knew their location, but didn't know exactly where they were camping. They knew kind of the borders of their territory because the Kichwa people who lived along the borders of their territory said it's not safe to go over there. Mm. Um, wow. But had no idea within those borders then where anybody was. Did did the tribe have a reputation for anything at the time or was it just... Yes. A, okay. Yeah, they were... The Kichwa called them Auka, which in their language meant savage and they had had a reputation basically since the Spanish arrived for killing people who came into their territory. Wow. Um, they had been real badly mistreated first by the Spanish conquistadors and then by the rubber hunters uh, who followed and they were going to defend themselves. Hmm. And so they, so you said Nate flying in this plane happened to see some of their buildings and then what happened next? So there are different people remember different things about exactly how it went down. But basically, Nate went to Jim and to Ed and said, hey, guys, guess what? Um, and of course, they were just gung ho yeah. uh, and very excited about this possibility. And so they started pretty much immediately. They started planning for a way to make contact. And they planned over a period of months, but various things that were happening as far as Settlers who wanted to move into the territory and so on pushed them to feel like there was a sense of urgency to make a contact attempt now. And so uh, they did gift drops every week for a few months and then and then they struck out into the jungle and made a contact attempt. So they so they didn't fly in and like land. I think that's the picture that maybe a lot of us have is that they like they they did. Um, Nate flew them in one, he had a tiny little plane, and so they, they had a prefab tree house and a bunch of supplies, and he flew flight after flight after wow. flight to bring in the four other men and all of their supplies. Huh. Okay, and so then they're there in the jungle trying to make contact. What is that? What was that process like? Uh, it involved a lot of eating hamburgers, putting on bug repellent, reading Time magazine, <laughs> sitting in the river, and they would they had they had a few what they thought or hoped might be phrases in the language that they had learned, and they would stand in the river and shout them into the jungle. Oh wow! Uh, in Just hopes that hoping they'd come someone to them. would hear them and wow. come. Yeah. And so eventually they they did make contact. Yeah. And so what what happened then? How how long were they out there waiting? It would have been a couple of days at least. I would have to double check and yeah. be sure. But yeah, so so three, two women and a man came, appeared out of the woods. And of course, they couldn't understand each other at all. But they offered hamburgers and shared their bug repellent and uh, had what seemed to be, I mean, it was a peaceful contact for several hours. Yeah. So, And then what happened? One of the women got bored and left. And the man followed her, and the third woman appeared to be going to spend the night by the fire and then disappeared at some point in the night. And so then it was just the missionaries on the beach again. But they were hopeful that, that they had gone to get 
more people and they would come back. Yeah. And so Nate was flying then, I think the next day, over where they knew the settlement was and kind of looking to see if people were coming and eventually saw that a group was headed their way. Mm. Uh, and so... So then he, he was flying in a plane and the other guys were still on the ground at the time. So then did Nate land and kind of tell them that there's people coming? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so they waited, they waited for them to come. And of course, nobody knew this until years later, but the first group kind of came out of the woods and appeared to be friendly. And then a second group ambushed them Mm. um, out of the woods. Did they ever consider taking weapons with them? Was that ever something that they were going to do? They did go armed, yes. Mm. But they, their plan was really to use the, the guns to scare them off not to actually fight back yeah yeah and And of course they didn't they didn't think they were going to be ambushed like that how then did the other missionaries mostly wives how did they find out about what had happened well nate had scheduled radio contacts that he was supposed to be making um, and when he didn't make the sunday afternoon contact um, his wife marge contacted elizabeth elliott who uh, everybody called Betty at that point and said that she hadn't heard from him. Uh, but they decided to wait until the next morning before they contacted the other MAF, the Missionary Aviation Fellowship pilot who was in the area. Uh, and so in the morning they, they contacted Johnny Keenan and said they didn't make radio contact. This is where they were. And so he went out to look for them. Um, and flew over the location and um, saw the plane on the beach, and it had been pretty much stripped of fabric. And so then he came back, and they initiated a a full search party. And And so then um, how did they, what was the search party like? Did they send people in to recover the plane and and look for the the guys, or was that uh, all just done by plane? Um, They had a combination. There was a ground search party and... Um, both the Ecuadorian Air Force and the U.S. Army Air Corps coordinated a, an air search. Mm. And did Elizabeth play any role in, in that search process? Um, no. The the MAF pilots brought all of the wives so that they could be together in one place at Nate and Marge Saint's house, and they basically just had to wait, which was really hard. Yeah, I can't imagine what that would be like. What were the the weeks and months immediately following Jim's death like for Elizabeth and for the other women there? I can't speak to the other women's experience for the most part, but um, I think for Elizabeth, they were very much a whirlwind or a blur uh, in a lot of ways. She, the uh, During the search itself, they were feeding dozens and dozens and dozens of people who had come to commiserate or gawk or uh, help or whatever. It was a really busy time and they were just cooking and doing dishes and laundry over and over again from dawn till dusk. And then when all of the men were known to be dead, they had a memorial service. And then she packed up uh, her baby and went back to her mission station and started trying to do the jobs that two people had been doing uh, all by herself. And so she was just run off her feet for a long, long time. Was she by herself then with, uh, her, with her daughter? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, the she was, there weren't other missionaries living there. Yeah. Obviously, it was a, she lived in a community of uh, Quechua people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that that's one of the, the most amazing things about her story is that she uh, stayed on in Ecuador after Jim's death with her daughter. How old was her daughter at the time, roughly? She would have been uh, just shy of two, I believe. Hmm. So what was the response to her decision to stay in country um, with her daughter? Did she get pressure from anyone to to leave in light of what had happened? I don't know how much direct pressure she got. I think she got a lot of surprised responses. Um, and she had a little... I don't know that she would have phrased it this way, but she had a little bit of trouble with male missionaries in the area who appeared to think that because Jim had been killed that their station was unoccupied by a missionary and were making plans for what to do with it uh, without talking to her about it first. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, was that a hard decision for her, do we know, or was she pretty set from the very beginning, like, I'm going to stay here? I think she was pretty set from the beginning. They had discussed before he left, what do you want me to do if you don't come back? And he said, just keep teaching the believers and close the close the school. <laughs> that, that'll be too much for you to worry about. Um, and so I think she kind of felt like it was carrying out his wishes, mm. um, probably, as well as obedience to God's call to her directly yeah. um, to stay. Yeah. So, so that, that, that kind of gets more amazing in that she not only stayed in Ecuador, but then she eventually, uh, I don't know, a couple years later, I believe, actually moved to the village for this tribe that had, had killed her husband, along with Rachel Saint, the wife of yes. uh, another one of the, the, the guys sister. who was killed. Oh, the sister. Oh, the That's yeah. right. And and then with her daughter and actually started living with them. How did that develop? How did she end up making that decision and actually having that contact with them again? She um, had been still in Shandia, and then um, she had been asked to go and stay with um, another missionary couple who were living right on the edge of Weirani territory. And the man was going to go on a trip, and so she was going to go and stay with the woman of the couple. And while she was there, three Weirani women came out of the jungle at a Quechua settlement a little bit farther down, kind of down the trail. Um, and that settlement sent a runner up to the missionaries to let them know, oh, oh, by the way, these women just came out of the jungle. Wow. And so she went, she left Valerie with the family she was staying with and went back with the runner and met these, but at that point, one of the women had gone back into the jungle, but met these two women and, uh, and they ended up living with her for the next over a year. Wow. And so the, the, how about that decision? Was that something that she struggled with and wrestled with, especially having her young daughter with her? Or was that, again, a pretty easy decision for her? I think she wrestled with it a lot before she actually had to make it, kind of wrestling with hypotheticals. What If this happens, what will I do? What should I do? What will I do with Valerie? Those kinds of things. But it sounded like she felt like it was an easier choice when she actually had to make it, that that there was somebody there to care for Valerie, that she had you know, been praying for for years for the chance to do this, mm. and she felt like it was God's direction to go. Mm. So in 1957, I believe it was, she published uh, Through Greats of Splendor, which was this book that kind of told the story of uh, her husband and the other missionaries there. Uh, and that became a bestseller, and I believe it was actually listed by Christianity Today as one of the top 50 books that have shaped evangelicals. What do you think was so compelling about that book uh, that led it to that level of success? Well, I think one thing was that there had been previously a lot of, of news coverage. Americans at the time were were really interested in knowing about the rest of the world. Mm. Um, and so when this happened um, and Life magazine sent a photographer down to cover uh, the story of the death of the five men. That Life magazine article was read by a lot of people. And so there was people kind of knew the story and wanted to know more um, when the book came out, which I'm sure helped with um, kind of the initial sales and interest. Yeah. Do you know, did she, did she want to write that book herself or did a publisher approach her and ask her about that? What was the, the history of that? That's a pretty amazing story. The, the widows had, had asked someone else to write a book um, and he had agreed to, and then he had gotten a contract with the publisher and, um, and then it had that had kind of started to look like it wasn't going to work. And so the publisher initially sent someone to meet with Elliot and and look at her source materials, Jim's diaries, those kinds of things, and interview her to see if they could help with the book. And then they asked her to come to New York and consult on final kind of final revisions on this book. And when she got there, the they sat her down and said, uh, we actually don't have a book. <laughs> You're going to write it. <laughs> wow. So she thought she was there to, to look at a manuscript and kind of give feedback? Yeah. They had her write cold, do a writing sample. And after they'd looked at it, they said, okay, 
we want you to write it. Wow. So. And what was her response? Was she you know, receptive to that from the very beginning? or? I think she was probably pretty blown away. Uh, she had It had been a really hard decision for her to make even to go to New York to consult and leave her station and her work and so mm. on. And uh, and this, of course, meant, you know, staying away longer and so on. Yeah. But Did she ever speak about what she hoped the book would accomplish? Like, what was her what was her goal with, with somebody writing a book, even if it wasn't initially her? I think, as, as far as I can tell, she and the other wives really wanted, they wanted something good to come out of something bad. M- maybe a good way to kind of sum it up the the life photographer who came to take the pictures after the men had been killed he photographed kind of the search party and the burial and then he hung around the mission station for several days taking pictures and asking questions and as he asked questions about why these families were here what they were doing kind of their motivations uh, elizabeth had shared with him you know, excerpts from Jim's journals to try to answer some of his questions. And he had told her, uh, some other people I think had given him some Christian books to read too. And he had told her, you could never convince me with these books, but you you might be able to convince me with the journals of Mm. these men. Mm. Um, And so I think kind of from the beginning, she was very motivated to share the words of the men themselves uh, and convey to the world why they were there and what they were trying to do. Mm. Yeah, I'm struck by just the significance of those experiences, that example of that they set gave more weight to their words, Jim's words and her words. Do, do you think that she understood that early on, kind of the significance of, of their story and their legacy moving forward? I don't think so. I think she was recently widowed, had way too much work to do, was trying to do it while raising a very young child, uh, and was just putting one foot in front of the other and trying to be obedient in the now. Mm. So eventually she did end up moving back to the United States when and where she got remarried. What was behind that decision to, to leave the mission field? I think that... She had been thinking for a long time about what to do as Valerie got older, as her daughter got older. Uh, It was difficult to homeschool her and uh, do all of the other things that she was trying to do. Uh, And of course, she wanted her to have birthday parties and museum visits and ballet lessons Mm. and those kinds of childhood things which were not available uh, where they were living. Were there other children around them? Like, would she have had her daughter had peers and friends? Yes, there were peers and friends. They were indigenous. There weren't other Anglo kids around. And I think that made a difference uh, in her mind, unfortunately. Could Valerie uh, speak the indigenous languages? Yes, much better than her mother. (laughs) Yeah, but Elizabeth did learn the languages and was able to to interact. Yes, as I understand it, she was... She was fluent in Quechua, which was the language that she used the most while she was there. And by the time she left the Weirani, she was very conversant. Yeah. So then she, uh, after returning to the U.S., was married again, her husband Addison. Uh, But then he died, I think, just four years after they got married. Yes. What impact? I mean, that's just kind of mind-boggling to think about for someone who had already lost her first husband and then so soon losing a second. Uh, what was that like for her? Um, I think it was, again, really difficult. I don't know that anybody could ever go through an experience like that and not have it be difficult. But she, kind of the same thing, she she tried really hard to discipline her thinking to live in today. Uh, and to just take one day at a time and to do what she had to do to walk with the Lord and love other people in that day. Mm. And so that's kind of how she walked through it, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she married for a third time in, I believe, 1977. And that was her husband, Lars, who was then with her till her death in 2015. And as we've mentioned already, she had this 10-year struggle with dementia. What was that like for Lars? You spent some time with him, talking with him. 
Uh, he's still living today. What was their relationship like? They were very private about their relationship, I think. I do know that he was maybe more outgoing and gregarious, and she was maybe a little bit more naturally reserved. But uh, I think, if I am understanding him correctly, that he kind of felt like it was his job to to take care of her. And so when, you know, when she started needing more care, he was faithful to provide that. Mm. And she did not like, as I understand it, the idea of going into a care facility. And he made a way for her to live at home yeah. and be cared for. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, and, and it's amazing, too, to think that her um, her popularity didn't wane back in the 50s or 60s. Really, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, even, she had um, pretty thriving ministry and wrote a lot and, and even hosted a radio show called Gateway to Joy for, I think, over a decade. And she opened every show with this the same line. And so it's, you are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot. And I wonder, what do you think that that simple little opening line reveals about kind of who she was and her character and her, her view of the Christian life? I think from very early in her writing career, it's pretty clear that the key thing about the Christian life to her was the character of God. And so I think that that distills her understanding of the character of God. God is love. Uh, She calls him at one point inexorably loving. And so that's, I think, she was big on obedience, but to obey, she felt you had to trust. And to trust, she felt you had to know the character of uh, of God, Mm. a God who is love. Hmm. Yeah. What would you say were Elizabeth's greatest strengths? She had a phenomenal memory for what she read. And her letters and her diaries are just stuffed with quotations that are, she was pulling them, pulling Hmm. them from memory by and large. Was she an avid reader? Yes. Oh, she loved to read. What kinds of books was she interested in? Everything under the sun. Her parents mailed her books. Her siblings mailed her books when she was in Ecuador. Friends mailed her books. Uh, and then once she was being published by Harper's, they mailed her books, boxes <laughs> and boxes of them. Books to, to endorse or? No, just gifts, oh, just wow. to read. Yeah. And she would, she worked in the morning and in the afternoon and again after supper. But during meals, she would prop up a book uh, and eat and read. And she would read, I mean, Dickens, Camus, the medieval mystics. She was a big fan of Time magazine, Freud, Tillich, Amy Carmichael, you name it. Anything and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So what are some of her other strengths that you were going to mention? I think another strength is just her commitment to waiting on God, probably. That she just, whatever happened, she just reminded herself of what she believed to be true. I can imagine for anyone just facing as much tragedy as she faced in her life and difficulty, there's the temptation to feel bad for yourself and pity yourself and wallow in that sadness. Did, did she ever struggle with that, with the, with the why me kind of question? I don't. I think she would have told you that she struggled with self-pity, but I don't think she ever asked, why me? Uh, And I think that she, she was, she tried to watch out for self-pity and turn away from it. Mm. How about weaknesses? What were some of the, what would you say were her greatest weaknesses? I think she was an introvert and I think she was a pretty reserved and private person naturally. And I think she could come across to people as being cold and standoffish. And for some people who maybe had listened to the radio program and had heard her say, this is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, who maybe to meet her in person and, you know, at a speaking engagement or whatever and find her not as warm and fuzzy as they had 
maybe expected her to be could be off-putting. Yeah. Did she do a lot of public speaking? A lot, a lot of public speaking. What was the, the context for those those events? She started speaking almost immediately. I mean, the first time she was back in the U.S. after Jim was killed um, was to write th- Through Gates of Splendor. And she she turned down all speaking engagements on that trip but the next time she came back on a furlough she she said in her letters uh, to her family that she wasn't going to take speaking engagements but then uh, they refer all through the trip to showed slides (laughs) here spoke twice here uh, and it just snowballed from there and I think she got in the 60s she was getting five or six invitations to speak a day uh, in the mail uh, and could barely keep up with replying to them all so it just kind of people just kept inviting her. She struggled with knowing how many to accept, but she did a lot of speaking. Yeah. Well, what do you think was behind broadly just the the fascination that not just Americans generally, but now for a longer time that Christians, uh, evangelical Christians have with uh, her story? I th- think that there's a great temptation to want to be able to put a bow on hard things that happen. And I think you can certainly read Through Gates of Splendor as kind of a triumphant. We can already see now how God is bringing good out of bad kind of a book. Mm -hmm. And I think we like to tell stories like that Mm. because we like to, we like to understand. So I think maybe that is what's behind kind of the fact that we're still telling that story. Yeah. Do you think she viewed it that way? That her story and her life was this kind of triumphant? I suspect not. I think certainly when she left Ecuador and left the mission field, she felt it had been a series of losses and failures and that there wasn't a lot of triumph there and that it was too early to say this is what God is doing. She believed that God was doing uh, and that God was going to ultimately bring good out of bad. But I don't think at that point that she thought that you could point to what the good was mm-hmm. for sure. Do you have a, like an interesting anecdote about her or a story about her that you think listeners would be surprised to hear or that would kind of be unexpected? I think... In person, especially when she was with her family and was comfortable, it sounds like she was just hilariously funny. Mm. Uh, She was a good mimic. She had a good ear for people's speech and, and and a good memory. And so she had long comic pieces memorized (laughs) and could give you a bit by comedian Joyce Grenfell was one of her favorites. And Mm. she could do one of Grenfell's (laughs) set pieces. And when she was with her siblings and her parents, they loved to do charades and swap funny stories, things that they had seen that day that had tickled their funny bones. And she and her mother particularly would lean back in their chairs at the table and just laugh until they cried. And so mm. just that that sense of humor, I think. Yeah. I've, I've got one other thing I could share, which is that I think she came across often as being very confident and certain. And I, I think that she was certain of a few things, mm. the character of God, mm. uh, for example. But I think a major theme throughout her life was a sense of uncertainty and not knowing what to do. And she really felt dependent on careful Bible study and prayer over a long period of time before making decisions. And I think she was more of a seeker in that sense than she often appeared. Because, of course, once once she reached a conclusion and wrote it down, you didn't see all of the hours of thought and prayer that had gone into it ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. What did her kind of personal daily walk with God look like? What was her Bible study or Bible reading routine like? Uh, her prayer life like? She got up early to make sure that she got it in. And uh, she would pray old hymns or, you know, written prayers that she had found and saved. And and she just read through the Bible 
I think, basically over and over and over again at a pretty phenomenal rate. Do we, do we have, does she mark in her Bible at all? Do we have any, have you seen any of those? Yeah. She, um, she would note significant dates next to passages all through her Bibles and things that I think a date that she felt like that verse had been for her you know, mm. on that day. And so, yeah, so her Bibles are neat to look at. Well, Lucy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us about Elizabeth Elliot and share a little bit about her life and the impact that it's had on you and, and your thinking about the Christian life. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. That was Lucy S.R. Austin on the life and legacy of Elizabeth Elliot. For more, be sure to check out her new biography with Crossway, Elizabeth Elliot, A Life. Pick up a print copy of the book for 30% off or get the ebook for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org plus. For more audio content like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a review. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.